Hi, Gary Stearman. Welcome to another edition of Prophecy in the News. Today, we have special guest L.A. Marzulli. He has written, of course, On the Trail of the Nephilim. He has some amazing stories to tell. L.A. Marzulli, always a pleasure. Great to be here, Gary. Thanks. You have some really amazing information to share today. Now, you recently made a a trip that Uh uh, took you to places in South America Mm -hmm. where you saw amazing sights, and one incident in particular made the world news. Well, it happened this way. First of all, in South America, in Peru, there are these elongated skulls. Um, They look like this, and while some of them may be the result of cradle headboarding, which is when you take a small child, and you bind the head, Mm -hmm. and and you shape the skull. Others are not. And apparently, about two years ago, Brian Forrester um, sent samples to Lloyd Pye, or somehow Lloyd Pye got samples from this. Whether Lloyd came down himself and took them, I I really have no idea. But Lloyd Pye had the samples and gave those to his geneticist. This is what I received from the geneticist through Brian Forrester. I have spoken to the geneticist. Um, He will not come on the record yet. We are in the process of attempting to get um, valid samples, which we then can can verify through the archaeological um, people that we have on board Uh and and the Peruvian government and get them to a lab and test them. But these are the preliminary DNA results from one of the samples, and I'm reading this verbatim. This is from a geneticist. Whatever the sample labeled 3A has come from, It had mitochondrial DNA with mutations unknown in any human, primate or animal known so far. The data is very sketchy, though, and a lot of sequencing still needs to be done to recover the complete mitochondrial DNA sequence. But a few fragments I was able to sequence from the sample indicate that if these mutations will hold, we are dealing with a new human-like creature, very distant from Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and then his ovens. I am not sure it will even fit into the known evolutionary tree. The question is, if they were so different, they could not interbreed with humans. Breeding within their small population, they might have degenerated due to inbreeding. That would explain the buried children that we find, and they were either low or not viable in reproduction. Wow. And, and of course, uh, those words had some impact and uh, basically went viral throughout the world. It really did. It was picked up on numerous websites. I know I was on Alex Jones' website linked to it. I mean, it was, it's been everywhere. People have sent me numerous emails with different links. So it, it, was, it, it really went a lot of places, and, and rightfully so, because for, uh, people have been looking at these elongated skulls, and, and uh, there's basically two viewpoints. One viewpoint is simply that these are all cradle headboarding and there's nothing genetically anomalous with them. The other viewpoint, which is the one I hold to, is, wait a second, folks, let's take a real hard look at these things. First of all, many of them um, have 25 to 35% more cranial capacity than a normal skull. All the cradle headboarding in the world is not going to create a larger cranial capacity in yeah. a human being. Very true. Plus, some of the skulls, many of the ones that we've seen, only have one parietal plate. There was a complete absence of a sagittal suture, that, that suture which goes on the top of the head like this and splits uh, into two parietal plates. It, it doesn't exist in now, many of these skulls. When you went to Peru and to other places, and you can explain where you went, uh, these skulls are not a rarity. There are lots of them, right? Yeah, it's not like <clears> you <throat> see one or two. At, at the museum that we were at, in particular, uh, Senior Juan's Museum in Paracas, um, he's got a collection of over 40 skulls that are there. Out of the 40, I would say about a third are elongated and not the result of, of cradle headboarding. That's just an estimate. Uh, when we were down there recently, we took an archaeologist with us, Aaron Judkins, who examined all of the skulls and, and, and focused really on the ones that he thought um, were anomalous. And those are the ones where we took measurements. Um, we weighed the skulls. We measured the cranial capacity. We did all that. That report will be in On the Trail of a Nephilim, Volume 2. Mm. Now, when you talk about Nephilim, you're talking about that word that appears in our Old Testament, Genesis chapter 6. 
And the Nephilim seem to be the offspring of uh, a, an illicit breeding program, mm -hmm. if you will, between fallen angels and human women. And even Jude talks about the angels who left their first estate. Sure. I mean, this is nothing unknown, mm -mm. but the, the subject is a bit touchy. Uh, there are a lot of Christians who simply want to let this one lie because it's kind of controversial. Why is it important to follow this? I think it's extremely important mm. because Jesus himself points back to the days of Noah and says, it's going to be like the days of Noah mm. when I return. Well, yeah. that begs the question, what differentiates the days of Noah? There's this new movie coming out on Noah. And of course, they're really not going to deal with the Nephilim, which is, in my opinion, really was a result of the flood. That resulted in the, in the judgment yeah. of the flood. The Nephilim were on the earth and also afterwards. There's a genetic breeding program going on by the fallen one himself, Satan, to create man in his own image, to, to somehow um, contaminate the genome. This is back in the days of Noah. So Messiah would never be born. And the same type of thing is going on now, we feel. Of course, we link it in our Watcher series with the alien abduction phenomena and the breeding program, which seems to be linked to it. I'd like to read a couple of passages of Scripture in this context <clears throat> because <coughs> giants are everywhere in the Old Testament. Uh, in the days of Abraham, Genesis 14, and here is in verse uh, 5, and in the 14th year came Kedilaomer and the kings which were with him. Now, Kedilaomer was Gentile king. He came to make war with, uh, ultimately with Abraham <clears throat> and smote the Rephaims that were in Ashtaroth Canarim and the Zuzims in Ham and the Amims in Shaveh Kiriathayim. Three different breeds, if you will, That's or right. types of That's giants right. are mentioned mm -hmm. in this passage. Rephaims, uh, Zuzims, and Amims. And then if I go over, I have another place marked here, bear with me, to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 2, verse 10. The Amims, now these Amims are giants, dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many. And tall, it says, as the Anakims, which were also accounted giants, Raphaim, as the Anakims, but the Moabites, it says, called them Amims. Now, this is talking about something that really happened. Sure it did. In other sure words, yeah. there were these strange creatures. Now, here's what I, I'm, this is the reason I'm reading this, because these characters, the Anakims, the Amims, the Zuzims, all these giants, are condemned in Scripture. That is to say, God did not bless these people, but rather commanded Moses, uh, well, even in Joshua the days of Caleb, Abraham sure. and then in the days of Moses, to, to do away with them. Mm -hmm. and, and so how does this all fit together? It fits together this way. What we're looking at is a hybrid being part fallen angel uh, and, and part human, but it's not human. And this is why, and of course, it's an abomination in God's sight the Nephilim and all those different tribes with perhaps different genetic characteristics were never supposed to be here. They are literally anathema in God's eyes. And this is why the judgment is always final and without a shred of grace and mercy. However, when you look at the God of the... And people have a problem. Why would God do this? But when you look at Jonah and he goes to Ninevite and, and the Ninevites, and I've done studies on this, yeah. These guys invented the word barbarian in, in right. some ways. Yeah. You know, when you went to when you went to Nineveh, heads on a stake around around the city. These people were bloodthirsty, yet God extends the olive branch and sends Jonah and the city repents. There's always a there's grace and mercy extended to these to the Ninevites. There's never any grace and mercy extended to the Nephilim in th throughout all of scripture. And this, I think, is extremely telling because it ties into the book of Revelation at some point. And it ties into the report that you just read yes, from the geneticists. Absolutely. These would not be humans and therefore could not be redeemed or would not be subject to redemption mm -hmm. as are humans in the Bible. Uh, the, <clears throat> the thread of redemption that runs from uh, the seed of the woman all the way to the Lord Jesus Christ, let's face it. It's for humankind and not for those who are non-human. And in that scripture, the seed, seed of the woman is a, precedes that the seed of the serpent. And so we see this seed war that's going on. And this is what I, I think a lot of people miss. You just mentioned those two 
passages of Scripture and those different tribes, I believe those different tribes had different genetic characteristics because the fallen one is messing with the genome and he's trying to create man in his own image. This is what he's trying to do. We also believe the theory that we're going on, and this goes back into Peru, is that during the conquest of Canaan, when Joshua and Caleb came into the land, the Nephilim tribes spread out. Some went through Europe, Northern Europe, over to the Americas, settled out in Ohio, and expanded. And, and on, the, on the trail of the Nephilim Volume 2, I've sat down with a lot of, well, not a lot, but several Native American peoples, elders and elderesses and chiefs, who have all have told me the same story, that their ancestors came here and battled giants that's what they that's what mm -hmm. they fought some of them were cannibals some of them were red hair when we go down to peru what do we see not giants but these elongated skulls something is going on and we believe that it's it's been hidden it's been sort of swept under the rug and now that's that's why we're on the trail to uncover this now let's talk for for a moment about the uh the neolithic structures the uh the structures lying around in mm -hmm. a broken state, and when you go down and visit these places, mm -hmm. and you've visited several of them, tell us about them. Well, these are megalithic, huge stone structures, and and many of them, for instance, in Puma Punku or Tiwanaku, which I just returned from recently in Peru, and all this, of course, will be in on the trail volume two. Uh, what's interesting about these sites is uh, several decades ago, archaeologists went down uh, to Tiwanaku and began to reconstruct what they thought this area looked like. And they were told to immediately stop because, wait a minute, you guys are just thinking it looked like this. No one really knows. Some of these stones, Gary, weigh you know, 20, 40, 60, 100 tons. They are absolutely enormous. They are quarried from miles away. Mm. They are set in place. And what we are looking at, in my opinion, we see holes drilled in with absolute precision into the, some of the blocks. We see channels and grooves. These are not temples, in my opinion. These are some sort of machine, an energy-collecting machine, I believe perhaps part of this grid system that once covered the earth. But when, when you walk around Tiwanaku or Pumapunku, and, and, we, and, and you get the sense, that the feeling that, that this was very deliberate, it wasn't some sort of a temple. It, it had some utilitarian purpose. And it's huge. Is, it's absolutely humongous, which has long since vanished. I believe through some great cataclysm, and we're actually, Brian Forrester, my colleague, is testing some of the rocks just to see how old they are. It'd be very interesting to see if they fit back to the time of Noah's flood, which is what my hypothesis would be. And, and they do look as though they've, they've gone through some <clears throat> cataclysm, yes. like a flood. Yes. They're partially covered with silt, and yes. in, the, in the panoramic pictures, which you have many, they actually appear to be partly buried by mm -hmm. a flow of ancient uh, exactly. debris. Absolutely. <clears throat> the, some, some cataclysmic event came, blew this structure apart, scattered many of the places or many of the rocks <coughs> Excuse me, in different places. Yeah. But there are still the foundation stones, and this is what's incredible, that you can take a level, and thousands of years later, they are dead level, absolutely perfect. And by the way, you're working on uh, Watchers 8, and mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot of this in Watchers 8, Correct. just a little bit of a preview. And I've had an opportunity to see a few photos. For, uh, you won't believe this. But let's go back <coughs> now. Let's go back to your study of giants. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to these, the strange skulls that you've found, uh, you've also searched for giant skeletons to corroborate the biblical sure. accounts, saying sure. there were giants living among us. Wayahara, Catalina Island, off the coast of California. Tell us about that. Well, this is um, this is an exclusive for Prophecy of the News. Uh, you're the first show that I've even talked about this openly with, and um, this will be an trail of a Nephilim Volume Two. Uh, mm -hmm. I was able to go out to Catalina Island. It took about six months of of um, emails and and a, a little donation to the museum there. And um, uh -huh. I was able to access um, um, this by, uh, a primitive archaeologist by the name of Ralph Glidden, who conducted digs there in the 20s. What was incredible is I got to handle his journal, handwritten notes, looked at his typewritten pages, looked at the photographs which he took or other people took of some of these digs. Now, when I got there, these things weren't all in a heap. They were all picked through, um, cataloged, labeled in boxes. It was a museum setting. I wore white gloves. 
Uh, my, tr my, my camera was set up on a tripod, and I spent 10 hours in the archives looking at every piece of information I possibly could on Catalina and Ralph Glidden. I found four pictures which are absolutely astounding, and the, and the one we're going to show you is Ralph Glidden standing in a pit, a recently excavated pit in front of him in situ, lying the way it was put into the grave hundreds, maybe a thousand years ago, we don't know, <coughs> is a very large skeleton. Fast forward to uh, a find in Glidden, Glidden's journal where he said discovered a, the bones of an enormous giant which must have been well over eight feet tall. And we have that a photograph of that uh, journal entry. So now we've got Ralph Glidden standing in a pit. He's five foot eight inches tall. We know this by numerous people who knew him in life and, and, it can, it, and it can attest to the fact that he's five foot eight inches. I took that picture. In fact, you were the one who told me, Gary, that, that there were people with computer programs yes. who could extrapolate the height. And taking your prompt, I then posted it on my blog. And the three people that, or the four people that, that responded, had this is a first maybe for them, have no idea that there are four of you working on the picture. So I had a blind study going yeah. with four people who had no collusion between each other examining the picture. And based on Glidden's five foot eight height, they were able to separate the skeleton and through the computer graphics and extrapolate the height. And this is where it gets amazing. And it may be really the first hardcore photographic evidence we have of giants in America. The skeleton is eight and a half feet tall, eight foot six inches. That's what it was. And, and all four put it between eight and nine feet. One, one gentleman put it at nine and a half feet. So I've, I've so we've been conservative. I'm going with eight and a half feet here. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely astounding. And it begs the question, Gary, where did the skeleton go and why would they hide it from Ooh, it? It is a question. By the way, uh, we've got an upcoming prophecy summit, uh, March the 28th through the 30th at Orlando. And we hope you can be there. I think, uh, L.A., you're going to be there. Yeah, right? I'll be there. And Richard Shaw, uh, my business partner, co-producer of Watchers. And yeah, you'll have a there. lot of very late material to present. We're going to be presenting some of what we're talking about today, Gary. Absolutely. Okay. And, by the way, there's something you should know about the Orlando Summit. Hello, Gary Stearman here with Bob Ulrich to talk with you about our upcoming Orlando Prophecy Summit, March 28th through 30th. Bob? The big event is almost here. There are close to 2,000 people registered. There are still a few spots left, but the next best thing to being there is live streaming. We're here today to make that announcement. We're going to have some incredible messages live streamed from the main auditorium at the Renaissance SeaWorld Hotel in Orlando. You'll hear men like Mark Biltz, and he has thrilled audiences everywhere with his famous blood moon phenomenon lectures. L.A. Morzulli, fresh off a trip to Peru, where he's uncovered evidence that we believe may be DNA evidence of the Nephilim. Chuck Missler, who never failed to come up with an amazing prophetic message. Jonathan Kahn, author of The Harbinger, and many, many more. All you need to do is go to prophecyinthenews.com. There's a $50 live streaming fee to have all these messages brought into your home. Go and sign up and register today. Well, let's return now to this discussion, and in my notes here, I wanted to assure myself that we didn't miss one basic idea, and that is there is a biblical importance to all this. In other words, you're not just uh, tickling some fancy by going out in the wilds no, no. and looking for giant skeletons. You're attempting to corroborate something that is a biblical concept. And I find very much so. And and you know it's it's high time that somebody did this because uh, go, going back to Catalina, there was this photograph of a skeleton lying as it was placed in the ground mm -hmm. in situ. Right. And we know from word of mouth reports that such skeletal finds are rampant That's throughout right. history. I mean, you go back a hundred years and. People coming across, uh, pioneers coming across the United States would report that they found giant skeletons and giant artifacts and so forth. But somehow those things got destroyed or hidden or whatever. So there's almost a, what? A, uh, I, I would say a deliberate cover-up. I really, I mean, that's what I believe. And other authors have said the same thing. The great Smithsonian cover-up um, have stated the, the, exactly the same thing. They're, the Smithsonian Institute in particular has gone after this stuff. What, and the reason why I know this is because Glidden worked for the High Museum. 
And so, okay, now we've got a trail. So where did, where did these skeletons go? They went to the High Museum. Well, the High Museum was gobbled up by the Smithsonian. And look, if someone really found an eight-and-a-half-foot skeleton out in Catalina, you would think that that would be the first thing that they would show people yeah. because, my gosh, look what was here. They don't do that. All this has literally been swept under the rug. It's been op deliberately obfuscated and kept away from the American people. And I think that's a crime. I think that's a real crime. Well, we read in Scripture just a moment ago. I just happened to think of, of a couple of verses before we came on the air, and I just read those. There are dozens like that that talk about the reality of giants. But it's not just the reality of giants. It's the historical fact that God did not bless those giant cultures, but rather regarded those as uh, as an accursed people. I, the most famous giant in the Bible, of course, is Goliath. Yes. Six fingers, by the way, <clears throat> says Scripture, and uh, which leads me to ask you a question. Have you found any six-fingered uh, skeletons? Well, Gary, <laughs> when I was out there looking at the photograph that Ralph Glidden took, there's a, a skeleton, and, it, and it's sort of maddening because even though Glidden was a primitive archaeologist, he never, ever put down a tape measure next to anything. Wow. So it's, it's, we've got this one photograph of a skeleton. I have no idea how large it is. What is fascinating about it, and see, if, 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 because I'm trained in looking with this paradigm of a Nephilim, I'm looking for things like giantism, six fingers, six toes. I'm looking for this. So there was one skeletal, one picture, and, and it showed a, a, a human hand, but it's not a normal human hand. It's got a six digit, and the digit is very pronounced. It's not like a little spur off the finger. It's a, it's a full digit like, like that, um, it, it, and it's, the thumb is curled underneath. And this was found on Catalina. And so we know of at least one skeleton with six digits. What's interesting, many Native American tribes talk about this, the fact that there were six digits and six toes. We know the Bible refers to this, yes. Goliath brothers having six fingers and six toes. So this is... This is probably a gen one of the many genetic markers from the seed of the serpent, which we're told, the seed of the serpent, which happens over and over and over again. And we find it on the shores of the West Coast on Catalina Island. It's absolutely astounding. And whenever the Bible talks about giants, like Og of Bashan, you right. know, the length of his bed is given, and, and other giants, they are never presented in a good light never. at all. Never. Not never. one time. And your work indicates that there's a way of tying in the history of the fallen angels to the development of mankind, pointing forward to what people can expect now going into the era when the Antichrist is going to be uh, exposed. Mm -hmm. Because it's your hypothesis that the very same fallen ones are going to bring the Antichrist to power. Absolutely. And, and I feel, and we've talked about this in the Watchers series, I've alluded to it in other books. The idea of this mark of the beast um, may be actually a genetic marker. In other words, it may be something, a chip, an implant, which goes in and changes the host's DNA. And maybe that's why the judgment for anyone who takes the mark is so severe. Because we know that anyone who takes the mark winds up in a lake of fire. We know that. Yes. There's no, there's, the grace and mercy is not extended to those people who take the mark. So something is going on with that mark that's been overlooked. Because to have that judgment, the severity, or the, that judgment to be so severe like that, um, it goes against the loving God we know. So it's, it's almost like the unpardonable sin. You take the mark, you're in the lake of fire. I mean, that's it. And that's because I believe these chips, whatever this thing is, and I believe it ties into the implants that we talked about, um, will change the host's DNA, thus making you, or the host, not human, as we know what in those days that in the days of the tribulation, men will seek death and not find and it. And not find it. What could that possibly mean? Uh, uh, other than some kind of a genetic curse, sure. perhaps. Right. Being kept artificially alive. Mm -hmm. uh, or perhaps the body repairs itself, uh, like the movie Elysium. You know, the body just genetically repairs itself yeah. type of a thing. So it's sort of the zombie, the zombie culture in the movies, mm -hmm. the... Uh, the UFO culture. The movies are foreshadowing all of this, by What's the way. What's coming? Hollywood is busy. Something is coming. Something is coming. <clears throat> by the way, I'm holding here uh, a double feature right in my hands. It's Watcher 6 and Watcher 7 beautifully packaged together in one 
uh, presentation package that, uh, listen, you're going to want to have your friends over and show them this. If you haven't seen Watcher 6 and Watcher 7, some of the most beautiful photography and UFO shots that you're not going to see yeah, anywhere astounding. else, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> Just unique. Uh, the double, the Watcher 6 and 7 double feature, yours for thirty four ninety five. And uh, just call the 800 number on your screen and uh, ask for that uh, Watcher's double feature. If you want all of L.A. Marzulli's work, I'm holding it here right now. And it is <clears throat> further evidence on the trail of the Nephilim, the whole Watcher's DVD series, <laughs> including uh, Watcher's 6 and 7. All of these items for one hundred and twenty nine ninety five plus shipping and handling, that would be about a two hundred dollar value had you bought them separately. Again, ask for the ultimate watchers collection. And they'll know what you're uh, talking about when you call the 800 number and ask for the ultimate watchers collection. One twenty nine ninety five. Uh, if you want just watchers six and seven, the double feature, it's thirty four ninety five and You'll be absolutely amazed. By the way, the award-winning, I should say, yeah. Watchers 7. Yeah. You recently won an award for the, for this work, along with Richard Shaw. Best film and People's Choice Awards at the UFO uh, EBE uh, Film Festival in Phoenix. So we were really ex uh, very excited about that. This is wonderful to me because th this brings uh, biblically uh, stimulated research into the secular yes, world. Yes, it does. And, and that's where it needs to go. Yep. People really need to understand that there is biblical truth, and it's not mere piety. What it is is sim simply reading Scripture and believing it as it's written and then passing that on to other people. And I think you've done a marvelous Thank job Thank you. Of that. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, it, there's a lot here to talk about. Uh, urge those in your church to begin study of Bible prophecy if they don't. We live in, in days when prophecy is absolutely coming alive on every front. You might say a word or two about that because that's where you live, right? Well, I do. In fact, the blog I wrote this morning um, uh, talked about go back seven years and, and the events that we're seeing now didn't exist before. And, and all combined, it's, it's, it's severe. When you look at Fukushima, when we look at the Arab Spring, the war in Syria, the weird, bizarre weather patterns and record, record temperatures being um, smashed on highs and right. lows and record tornadoes, record earthquakes globally. The 7.0 is, is the new norm, the California drought. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and, and record flooding and, and the bird and fish animal die off. UFO sightings, records there, 2,000 a month instead of a normal four or 500. And, and Jesus warns us. That it'll be like this in the last days. These are the signs to look for, and I think we're here. Ellie Marzuli, I can't add to that. Thanks for being Thanks, with us. Thanks, Gary. Today. Appreciate it. I'm Gary Stearman. Keep looking up, everybody. Prophecy in the News is a viewer supported program made possible by our many friends around the world. Be sure you tune in every day for breaking news and our daily prophetic news updates at prophecyinthenews.com or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash prophecyinthenews.